Perfect. And then uh, Marcus and Margarita are going to go ahead and start with their portion. All right, just give us a second. All right, thank you, Natalie. Um, I'm Margarita Benitez. I'm a professor at Kent State in fashion design. Um, and you are. I'm Marcus. I am. I am. Thanks, Natalie, for having us. Uh, I'm at the University of Akron. I'm a professor of art and graphic design. My uh, background primarily there, though, is uh, digital fabrication. And we started collaborating in the year 2000 um, in the design studio. And while we had started to dabble with art and technology, we felt it was really important for us to get formal education because there is a bit of a learning curve. Uh, when you want to work with uh, interactive materials, computer vision, or um, data. So that's the path that we took. And we have to say that is something that we were privileged to be able to do. Not everyone has right. that uh, that capacity, as well as back then, the internet wasn't as uh, prevalent and all these wonderful videos that you have online um, that you can find resources uh, available to you now that weren't available in the past. But our design studio in, in its essence um, deals with um, art design making and technology. So the research we do is sometimes further in one direction or another. Uh, we do like to collaborate with different disciplines as well. So we like to position our creative research at the intersection, kind of like the borders where these disciplines touch. And um, as a collaborative design studio, we always uh, want to make sure to integrate uh, as much as possible the spectator. But one of the things, I mean, every every artwork truly is is in itself interactive, but once you introduce the, the levels of technology, um, it is quite important that you don't necessarily overpower the work with technology. So you don't want to leave the spectator, the viewer, um, sort of thinking, oh, what's the trick? No, you want to get them um, to really negotiate and interact with your core concepts rather than uh, wondering why the technology is there, what the technology did. So one of the first interactive pieces we did, and I have to say also funding our, our work, it, we tried, we, ha we have tons of ideas, like everyone has a ton of ideas, but we have to find ideas that are funded through grants. So this was an NEA grant that we received uh, joint through our institutions, both University of Akron and Kent State, uh, where we developed an open source um, application and we collaborated with both computer science um, and dance to create a wearable garment that uh, that lit up and also was interactive. And the actual application was working on old little eye touches. So like your iPhone, but a bit smaller and some small laser Pico projectors, which basically a laser mini projector allows you to be able to uh, work with, um, with the the image is always in um, focus. in focus. So this was perfect because the dancers were then the gatekeepers of the images and the, the application both did generative images based on um, movement and the camera and the, the little eye touch camera, as well as it generated audio based on the movements, acceleration, position, all that good stuff. So it truly was the dancers were creating both the visuals and the, um, the sound for the performance. And, uh, we... Yeah, which is really kind of a new way of um, having interaction um, built in. So in, in, in a, we made the app and the little camera would essentially read color, make noise or sounds based off um, the color that it read. But then we gave that entire uh, design to the dancers and let them really do the artwork. So in, in, in that sense, they were our uh, gatekeepers of what the work would do. So there was four of them. The entire composition was Im improvised. The costumes came from us. The light came from us. The, the app came from us. The sound came from us. But really, they would make the work. So, so, so that level of co uh, collaboration is quite important to us. And we like the idea of the improvisation as well. There was a lot of practice getting to know the uh, the technology and how it worked. But once they got the handle of it and how they moved affected it, they were it was really fantastic to see. And each performance wasn't necessarily 
exactly the same. It was unique because of that reason. We also did a, a installation back in like, I don't know, many, 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 many years ago. We also had it ago. at the library, though. No? Yeah, and we had it at the Akron Library for a while, this um, this installation here, with, which we called iHeart. And basically, uh, this was back in Ingenuity Fest when it was in the bridge, which was such a fantastic location. And we created these, uh, we used digital fabrication to create these hearts that uh, lit up half half at a time. Uh, kind of referencing the Zelda hearts from gaming because I'm a big gamer and that the nostalgia of that really made me happy to see these giant hearts that were basically um, showing you the life that was on the bridge. So it interacted with tweets. So as, when people would tweet, it would count the tweets and the more people that were there tweeting about Ingenuity Fest, the more life hearts that would light up. And it was just a really fun um interaction to see and this was the first time we came across people taking selfies with our artwork which was very strange yeah, cool. I think this was like 2011 or something so it was very now you, you it's common but uh so then um from another interaction level we are going back to the sound where we actually created a a pool game where the open cv would read the position of the ball and make a composition of um uh, that's essentially upon the travel of the ball. So while you were shooting the game of pool, it would make the sound composition. So again, working with data in interactive means, and we then took the data uh, a step further to work with digital fabrication with 3D printing. And what you see here is a visualization repre uh, representing the data of one football game, American football, not, not real football. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <Oops. laughs> get a little jab in there. Uh, we like soccer. But um, yeah, so you, uh, what we did is we assigned a team to each side, and as the gameplay happened, each one of these arcs is a gameplay. So you could just see the data of one game at an instant and kind of really tell who was winning, uh, who won the game, who was doing good in the game. Uh, and we did this for the 50th anniversary of the Super Bowl, and we had 50 sculptures. And then we switched a little bit. We wanted to get, get out of the white cube of the gallery, talk a little bit about post-human design, and then started switching into um, uh, environmental design, sort of uh, exhibiting within like parks and uh, field stations. What we really wanted to do there is uh, 3D print uh, environments for, um, for animals, so what you see there was a uh, spider ring. So the spider ring, the spider would actually live in the ring. Um, it would li be lit up at night. It would make its web in the ring, and then um, so that would basically it's out for six months in 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 the field. It would light up at night, and uh, would basically the spider would be a participant in the artwork. Yeah, and again, questioning that that idea of who's the author of the art, we kind of place these in nature, but then the artwork only gets activated when the animals participate, but also when there's a viewer present, uh, which is kind of interesting. We did these little pollinator fountains, as well as a large scale chimney swift tower that we see and seed. And this is still available to view in Bath Nature Preserve. Um, then uh, our other body of work is sort of back in uh, the gallery where we are really interested in um, imprints on skin. So this, this work is called um, Skin Deep. It, the model wears either a flexible or a core uh, prosthetic around either the neck or the arm or the foot, foot. And when it removes, when the print is removed, it reveals patterns and type. And so that it gives you sort of this uh, temporary beauty modification. So rather than a long-term beauty modification, we're just still sort of instilling this entire discussion about what if we could uh, temporarily modify uh, either with patterns or with type sensitive areas of the body. And then we did a special one for a New Zealand uh, symposium where we we absolutely adore the body modifications and the tattooing of the Maori culture. And the, since it was in New Zealand, we wanted to create something that was specific addressing that. But as that foreigners, you have to be careful about appropriation. And then researching um, the Maori tattoos and body mods, we learned about a special type of tattoo that they call kirituhi, which is specifically for, for, for foreigners. Outsiders. For outsiders. So we worked with some of their patterns and developed a wearable sleeve as well as facial uh, tattoos with a cupping, a 3D printed cupping device. 
Um, so and, and that was brought in front of the council. So the council actually yeah. approved this. So that the, the New Zealanders take their heritage rather serious. So so we wanted to make sure that we don't um, step on on any um, that we really tread it lightly. Yeah, we wanted to get the the indigenous Maori uh, blessing to be able to move forward with it. If they would have said no, we would have never we would have never sh shown it. But that's about series of work we're still exploring. Um, and last thing we wanted to show is we've kind of delved into researching the idea of musical instruments with digital fabrication. And here we have um, a product. We've actually started to be entrepreneurial. We're gonna be launching a Kickstarter on this. And these are 3D printed percussion instruments. We have shakers, uh, which are really fun, um, but we also have drums. And uh, this is the first time we're publicly showing an image. We've had some local drummers and other um, musician uh, related people that are local come to the studio and give us feedback. Um, but yeah, we're we're really proud of our little babies. They sound they do sound great. And and we were worried about the sound since it is still <laughs> plastic, but it sounds great. So we're we're excited about this. And so yeah, we're switching a little bit from the artwork to sort of um product and small runs. So if uh later on if there is any questions towards uh, how to run multiples, uh, then we can speak to that as well. Yep. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus and Margarita. Um, I love seeing your work and how collaborative it is and um, really excited Thank to see what happens you. with the snare drum. Um, I believe Dominic is up next. Yep. All right. Hey everybody, my name is Dominic Moore Dunson and I'm a producer, choreographer and dancer here in Akron, Ohio. Um, I started making work back in 2016 with a company called Inlet Dance Theater in Cleveland. And then 2020 happened and me and my wife were pregnant and I started to just go out on my own and start making my own work um, for some reason. But um, it's been a great journey these last four years or so. And I'm excited to be here with you all. I am, uh oh, here we go. I am the founder and the co-owner of More Dunson Co., which is a performing arts production company housing national touring arts and entertainment products, but also local arts community engagement initiatives. We're committed to a style of storytelling that I created called Urban Midwest Storytelling, which is this juxtaposition between beauty and the hopelessness of humanity. Um, I found that being someone who grew up in Akron and was always struck by how beautiful our city was in terms of like the greenery and how much in the national park and all those things that we have, but then looking at like our urban landscape and how, how hopeless it looked growing up and just the juxtaposition of growing up in that environment and how it affected me as a young artist um, and then trying to bring that into how I tell stories as well. And, you know, I think part of what I talk about today is I'm coming to you as somebody who wouldn't define themselves as a technology based artist necessarily. Um, in the dance community, we call it lights and tights. That's what we do, right? Like we just get on stage, we do our dances, we get off stage and there's not usually a lot else connected to it. Um, but I found over the last four years a way to use this idea of technology to support um, what I've been doing versus trying to create something new. Hey, Dominic, I hate to yeah. interrupt you, but um, I think that your PowerPoint is not viewing on the screen properly. Oh, no. What do you see now? Do you see anything? No, so like it looks, you can see like the Canva and it, you can see where it says like present, but it's not. Oh, okay, hold on one second, guys. Let's see. Let's see. Boom, boom, boom. If I do this, oh, where are we? Let me know if you can see this. Yeah, that looks right. Awesome. So the first um, project I did, it was 2020 and the world kind of exploded. And right after George Floyd was murdered, me and my wife were having this conversation and we were pregnant with our first child. And during the conversation, I realized I was going to have to talk to my black son about police. And I didn't know how to do that. So I started calling around, asking a bunch of people questions. And I've been doing this process for a couple of months. And I realized at one point, you know, these conversations, I should probably like re record them somehow so I can have them. And when I started doing that, I realized that some of these things other people need to hear and I shouldn't keep this to myself. So after a lot of research, I decided to turn all these conversations into, 
into a podcast called In Cop Negro. And it's still on Spotify, it's still on um, Apple Podcasts. And as I was starting to make this podcast, I started to realize that, oh, I'm, I'm doing research for a dance. And I didn't realize that, right? I realized I was actively archiving this stuff so one day I, I could make a dance out of it. And it was just a really interesting process because it was podcasting. I've never done anything like that in my life, right? So I was starting to having to learn how to do all these things that felt scary, right? Because I don't feel like I'm a technologically sound person at all. But it was the desire to share stories that made me get over that hump. So I went through that process. I made this piece or this podcast. And then in 2022, when Jalen Walker was killed in Akron, I finally decided to take that information, all that research, and finally put it on stage in a piece called Incop Negro Aftermath. Am I my brother's keeper? Only if that homie don't creep up. So Aftermath was about asking the question, how does a community heal after police violence happens in it? And so we made this piece with two dancers, a hip hop musician and a saxophone player exploring this question. But everything we did came directly as a result of this research. You also notice in that video, there's a lot of these like nice camera angles because we did the piece in the round. During the creative process of that piece, I had the videographer come into the studio and just record things from different angles. And after rehearsals, he'd send me raw clips and I'd watch the show from all these angles. And I realized I didn't have to just use a videographer for the ending product, but I could use him in the process to make this piece. And because I was inside the piece, it was really hard for me to see what was going on. But by using his eye and through the camel lens, I was able to make new decisions about the choreography that I was never a, would have never made without him being there. So the process of using a videographer throughout the nine month period we made the piece is why the piece ended up being the way it was. So then the final, sorry, um, the final work that I'm working on right now is called The Remember Balloons. And it is based off the children's book written by Jesse Alaveros and illustrated by Dana Wolfcott. And it's about a boy named James. And James has all these balloons. And inside these balloons are his memories. And James loves his grandpa. They spend a lot of time together. And grandpa has all these balloons as well. And they're constantly sharing stories with each other about their memories. And the problem is grandpa's starting to lose all his balloons. So James goes through this story trying to figure out how do you become a caregiver and how do you care for someone who's suffering from memory loss, dementia, and Alzheimer's. Ultimately, having to learn what does it mean to be forgotten and how do you continue telling those stories? And you can see on the on the right side, um, my dancers are on stage and we're starting to use projection in my work for the first time. And the image in the back wall is an image directly from the book. So again, it's an, me starting to explore these things that I've never done before that feel really, really scary when the idea first comes up. How do I pay for it? What does it even mean to do all this stuff? I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I realized over the last four years that Although I wouldn't see myself as like, oh, I'm a technology based artist. It's that I've organically found a way to use technology to help me tell the community based stories I want to tell. So technology continues to stay supportive of the stories that I'm trying to communicate, as opposed to becoming like the central theme of the work. Thanks, y'all. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dominic. Your work is just so meaningful and the way that you, you know, I don't know, can tackle such difficult, you know, conversations in such an elegant way is just commendable. So um, thank you. And Ibrahim is next. 
let's first unmute myself and okay hello everyone um thank you so much um for having us and um thank you so much for the great presentations i have to say uh margarita marcus and um dominic i, I loved what i watched so hopefully i can add to the conversation more than become you know subtractive in a way so um, my name is Abraham Pustinchin. I'm an associate professor of um, architecture and digital design at Kansas State University and the founder of the Robotically Augmented Design Lab um, and the director there. So what, what I'm trying to talk about today briefly is um, maybe a few examples of our projects that are illustrating what I call or what I refer to as cyber physical art or design at large. So, so the work, um, generally speaking, whether it is through the studio work that we do or um you know the, the work that rad lab does or the work that um you know my practice studio ep does or even some of the studios it always tries to question the possibilities of um what i like to refer to as human machine collaboration or some sort of synthesis collaboration between uh, multiple agents so that includes the robotic arm that includes the um, digital fabrication mediums, interaction design components, AR, VR, or basically um, the, the spectrum of possibilities within the discussion of uh, human, non-human. So, so the work is really centered around the questions of how, um, so in a way, and I'm, I'm trying to be cautious about the, 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 the use of the term of um, democratization or accessibility in a way, but, but in a way it tries to um, create platforms or propose new kind of workflows to use either off-the-shelf techniques or technologies or uh, some of the custom-made ones as a way to bring agency to the non-human and, and kind of create a collaborative um, agenda between the human designer and the non-human designer and everything. So in a sense, uh, maybe related back to some of the previous uh, projects we saw today, um, it, it's, it has this um, uh, post-human uh, Kind of agenda to it um but maybe from a slightly different perspective of now trying to engage the machines and um, non-humans as uh, part of the design workflow and as part of the experience workflow so, so in a way it, it suggests that uh, both human and non-human can be the design or designer uh, as well as the the one that experiences that design and, and i'm just interested in kind of seeing how each of these Kind of juxtapositions or kind of misalignments can produce art or produce creative experience. So I'm just going to fast forward this. Um, I was a little faster <laughs> than I was expecting. But uh, what I'm going to present today, a few projects, um, are going to be, again, discussing the, the concept of hybridity. So that hybridity comes from um, human, non-human discussion, natural artificial discussion, and digital physical discussion. So the first project I'd like to talk about is actually the very recent one, um, the 2024 Hyperion installation, which um, is based on um, the Greek mythology. The Hyperion is the god of, or the titan of observing or watching um, uh, from above. So, so I, I, I'd like to basically ask a simple question in this um, installation, which is an speculative interactive AI installation. Um, the question of how, um, uh, the memories of a non-human or again especially as an immigrant myself have the memories of a space or memories of um collective um kind of shared ideas of a space can be translated through the lens of a non-human design so as an architect i'm interested in space and a spatial discussion of course but but then this time trying to break down a little bit of these biases of hierarchical relationship between human and non-human and human agent and the space, I'm trying to reverse the relationship simply by putting the non-human as the observer, this time being this 3D printed kind of fabricated, digitally fabricated object with a camera embedded and powered by AI and kind of the motion of the robot. To look back at us as quote unquote, um, uh, basically objects of uh, ob observation. So in a way it's trying to question or reverse the subject object relationship by putting the human and the space on the stage uh, and trying to give the non-human the, the agency to look back and kind of read whatever um, uh, biases it memories brings in. So, so this pro in this particular iteration of the project, um, it's um, kind of biased, if you like, or kind of loaded with memories of Baroque era and the Rococo era, especially, especially or specifically uh, trained on the ideas or the, um, the aesthetics of Bernini, uh, Gian Gianluigi Bernini and the Baroque uh, kind of era. 
as well as the memories of Porto. So this either iteration of Hyperion is just looking back at us and tries to look at the space, look at the human audience, look at almost everything through the lens of those biases and memories. And, and again, in a subject object reverse relationship uh, where um, you know it takes the agency as, as an active agent um, or as the participant this time, not only the producer of the art, not only a collaborator, kind of co-creator, but also this time again as, as a co um, um, inhabitant, um, if you like, of the, of the same experience. So um, yeah, this is basically the real time um, footage of the, um, the camera feed and the AI modified version of it, um, again, in real time. So it, it would start to see um, everything differently in a way and kind of try to um, make sense out of it based on quote, up, quote unquote, the memories of Porto and the memories of Barbara. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm probably just gonna fast forward. And here are some stills from the um, installation. Um, it was also a question of a bigger um, conversation, theoretical conversation, which I think may take a little time, but just to briefly um, describe it as a question of how the architectural setup can be animated or architectural environment can, can live after being built. So, uh, so in a way, it's part of a bigger series of projects, the Secret Life of um, kind of series, which again, looks back at uh, physical space as something that is um, that can be continued, um, the design of it and the experience of it, the experience of it through the lens of, um, you know, hyper reality or kind of mixed reality. So the second project, um, back from 2020, um, as Dominic was saying that time that we were trying to kind of make sense of things and kind of find new ways to communicate or, or, or think through the, the design platforms is a, uh, is an improvisation. It's a kind of a personal piece, if you like that looks at a few things that I like um, uh, and means to me um, more than just, again, um, uh, kind of a normal work that I would do, which is an improvisation between a classical Persian instrument, ancient instrument called tar uh, and a robot arm. So, so it's again, tapping into the questions of AI and agency of a non-human. And it's basically a duet project between um, myself as the performer and a robot arm that tries to perform along with me based on the notes that it hears, based on the gesture analysis, based on basically a series of data that it was being, um, it has been trained on as a way to create a, a, almost a performative relationship. So I'm gonna be a little silent. Now. So basically, I cannot be silent. <laughs> so basically, the idea is um, how it can a non-human uh, basically participate in a duet um, that is not just performative or it's just not interactive in a sense that it listens and performs, but since it's an improvisation, I'm also listening back or watching back um, some of the cues that it gives me on the monitor or some of the motions that it makes and try to manage the crescendos, the crescendos, you know, the, the notations and all of that as a way to kind of perform together. So, so in a way, uh, and it, it was the beginning of a longer project that I'm actually doing the, the next iteration of it um, very soon um, to, to kind of, again, create a co-creational kind of workflow or setup as a way to uh, make a duet in a sense. Um, so, again, I wouldn't bore you with the musical part anymore. And last one, um, the third project, which is our um, recent book that um, I co-edited with my um, co-editors, James Prestes and Vahid Vahdat, uh, which looks at more or less the similar uh, questions and trying to theorize some of those. So it's an edited volume. We invited um, and more than 30 some um, contributors to join us and try to kind of look at the idea of purple, what, what a purple architecture could be or what a purple design uh, or art could be in this case. Um, and, and obviously the, the idea is borrowed from the um, the, the famous Matrix um, uh, movie 
and the idea of a red and blue peel. And, and then we are proposing actually that there is a there is an alternative um, kind of peel in between. There is a whole spectrum of purpleness in between that is neither nor. So so it's in a way a non-binary take on cyber physicality, a non-binary non-binary take on um uh, a, a few of these kind of um solid biases that um uh, comes into the game of you know handmade art uh, technologically made and and again all of those are on that and and more and and we, and we try to kind of question that through a, a series of collection a collection of series of um essays and projects as well as uh, an augmented reality version of the book so the part that i want to maybe briefly talk about today is the idea of the book itself as an object uh, that is designed to be cyber physical beyond the content of it. So feel free to, I mean, NQR code that comes up, feel free to scan them. Um, this would give you access actually directly to download the PDF version of the book for free, uh, which was made possible thanks to our publisher, uh, Carnegie Mellon, ETC Press. But but just generally speaking, it's it's the idea of how we can challenge the book code of a book uh, as an object or as a thing or as a kind of a spatial experience potentially through the idea of uh, cyber physicality. So, so again, besides the, the conceptual or theoretical framework inside of the book, I designed the book in a way that um, it is going beyond the, the, the physicality of the book as an object and try to expand into multi-sensory, multi-dimensional, kind of multi-reality kind of, um, experiences. So from uh, alternative um, or alternate reality, um, kind of um, dividers, which are the AI-based generations of the essays. So there are just image essays, if you like, or image abstracts. So the typography of um, each of the titles to kind of the, the, the design of the whole thing, all the way to, which I'm gonna just jump ahead, to again, um, the 3D experience of the book as, a, as an inhabitable or as an experienceable object that is living beyond its bookhood. So, I tested a few of these um, AI filters that I developed for the book at, of course, our favorite um, piece of architecture, Akron Art Museum. But but again, it, it's the idea to question the 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 physicality of the book, but or trying to use the conventions of book design as as a way to augment some of these dialogues. So these are, as I said, the image essays, if you like, that are abstracted image take uh, of whatever that chapter is. Um, through the lens of a collaborative um, creation of uh, myself and uh, uh, AI agents um, and AI gener generative AI in this case. Uh, so similarly, as I said, and it's already, but uh, the AR experiences and feel free to scan this one. Um, this is what usually you should get at the end of the book when you read the whole thing. It's a trophy um, that kind of shows the completion of the book, but feel free to be my guest on this one. But um, yeah, so basically that's, maybe I stop here. I had another project, but for the sake of time and I, I look forward to the conversation, so I'll stop it here. Maybe just um, as a wrap up, um, and it was a little bit of a back stake scenario on that project. Just a wrap up that, yes, we did talk about hybridity. It was a conversation of human, non-human, natural, artificial, and digital, physical. And um, a lot of these projects and a lot more are, um, and this QR code if you're um, interested and I would love to be connected there. But with that, thank you so much and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Ibrahim. I think your idea of um, giving agency to non-human is really interesting and really on the forefront of you know the future of where, where art can be with AI and stuff. And um, I appreciate you sharing all that. Um, so now it's time to kind of jump into the discussion portion. And um, a few of you have kind of touched on this already, but um, thinking about, you know, incorporating technology and using technology, there's kind of a lot of mindset barriers to using that. So something about like, you know, using technology the right way, or um, I'm not good at technology or technology is not as um, authentic as physical art. Like a lot of you touched on these. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, what maybe some of those mindset barriers that you've had uh, working with technology and, you know, how you've overcome them or what, um, what advice you could give to an artist um, about that. Yeah, that's a, the biggest thing for me was just not getting so caught up in what the technology was and how much you didn't know about it. And then to start finding people who just know a little bit more than you do. And those people, once you talk to them, they might find the next person who might know a little bit more than them, right? So just like in any 
collaborative creative process, right? Like I work with dancers. I can't do a full eight piece ballet by myself because you need eight people, right? So I think working with technology is no different. You have to find the right collaborators um, to be in the room with you who have an expertise that you don't. So the feeling that you should know everything is the thing that I had to get through. And then to find people who had better knowledge than me who could come into my world and we could kind of create a shared language. Yeah, I would second what Dominic said, but maybe in addition to that also, what um, I think is maybe a little bit of a bias around technology and art or this, or maybe the difference, the major difference from, between us and maybe engineering department, for instance, is that actually we can benefit a lot from misusing the technology. We, and we are really the misusers whenever it comes to the, uh, you know, to the, to the official conversation. And, and that's really what everyone is looking forward to see um, I mean, you mentioned Natalie about the, some of the AI conversations recently, and and I think the more um, it kind of gets more accessible and usable, it's getting the excitement of misusing it rather than re duplicating or replicating what is already there. So, so in a way, I think maybe if um, I mean, it at least gives me a peace of mind when I work with some of these technologies that I mean, I mean, I'm not going to duplicate or replicate something perfectly because that's not my intention technologically. Rather, it's just another medium, another um, kind of application or tool to to just use it and potentially misuse it as a way to find a kind of interstitial kind of hidden possibilities that is not being there. So, for instance, for me, the robotic part, um, uh, I'm intentionally kind of uh, distancing a little from the fabrication because honestly, it's been um, done perfectly in industry, you know, for ages. So we try to kind of almost misuse dancing with a robot or kind of like performing with a robot. And, and I assume it's kind of similar in Margaritas and Marcus's with 3D printing. So, so I'll just stop here. Yeah, and I, I, I love what you both said. And I just like to present, you have to get very comfortable with failure, especially when you're starting, uh, because there's so many times with technology, if you put the wrong thing in code and you're just starting to use it, it could just blow up in your face. Another side of that is the inexperience with the technology sometimes gives you these happy accidents that occur where the subversion of the technology can come into play. So that's, it's, it's, you got to take it as a, a mindset of play. If you come into it with more of a play mindset and not just, I'm trying to get this done and, and get frustrated with it. Um, the ebb and flow will, will help you find the interesting concepts and, uh, and sort of the happy accidents really yeah. lead to to the best research outcomes. And so the other thing that I was going to say, I mean, it's sort of two points. For one, you really have to test the limits of the technology. I mean, push this technology as far as you can. Like breaking is, is part of it, right? I mean, we, all of us, Raheem's labs have a lot more funding than ours, but a good amount, like funding is somewhat limited in the art world regardless art architecture whatever F funding is limited right so your technology is not going to be the 500 million dollar printers that print metal perfectly all the time right it's going to be more like a thousand ten thousand two thousand dollar kind of thing and you must push the limits of that piece of equipment and when you do that and you're sort of giving up the 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 outcome right then then i think this really when the best work comes so don't be afraid. Don't worry about money too much and break things. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, I think an, um, one of the important you know, goals of having this conversation is being able to reframe the use of technology into just another artistic tool like anything else. And it has its own set of, you know, um, possibilities and also, you know, um, barriers and uh, pitfalls. So um, Marcus, you did bring up funding. So let's, oh, no. uh, <laughs> let's unpack that a little bit. There are some local, you know, um, local opportunities. All three of you can maybe talk about one in particular. Um, but then you also mentioned NEA funding. And in general, like, what type of advice do you have for like positioning yourself um, for those types of opportunities? I think it's a lot easier for the, those of us that are involved with institutions like right. uh, a university because there are, um, you know, research, uh, what are they called? Research Centers, research you know, research help research for research, funds. help with grants, help with the budgeting and all that. So that, I think that might be really difficult or, or just intimidating for someone to approach outside of an institution. 
but um, yeah, but there's plenty of there's, there's plenty, plenty of, of grants. local grants, yeah. um, local opportunities. Networking is always great. Showing your work, getting feedback, um, self funding. Don't worry about not having the latest tech. Don't worry about having to buy this or that. Um, old tech is just as good. a ten year old Arduino is just as good as a new it's Arduino nice today. Network. Uh, right, there's true. plenty of tech and with the whole planned obsolescence working with technology that isn't necessarily the latest and gre greatest can also bring you some uh there's also a ton of free resources i mean reuse the resources to your advantage so like you know i mean uh the aside from the wonderful ways the ai is being used i mean ai in its in its sort of idea and it's in in its original conceptualization as a large large language model helps find grants, find resources, research. So to don't don't yeah. just think of AI, oh, AI needs to make my art. Think of AI that does also can support your practice. And if you're a student or something, we, we could always use help in the studio. You can always try to connect with artists. Or come to the studio, or come talk to, the to studio, us. come to the studio, talk to us. Maybe we can find a mutual agreement where you can work in the studio as an apprentice or something. There, there's always ways to kind of get introduced to the technology. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I think um, all the suggestions are perfect and right on maybe um, one. I mean, I love the idea of um, because I do that too, <laughs> Marcus, like just using ChatGPT as the, you know, as a as a consultant in a way uh, and kind of ask a little bit of a suggestion there. But also uh, I find um, I or found a little bit of a use from some of these platforms that are collecting and organizing calls. So, for example, I use Artenda for instance, which is a very kind of, I think like three euros or some, something manageable um, monthly for the subscription, but they usually uh, manage all the, or collect all the calls or some, uh, you know, uh, advertisements or kind of, you know, exhibition calls or things like that. And also for grants. So, uh, and, and I couldn't agree more with the, with the, with the conversation about the size of the grant. Um, so it usually is a little bit of a, a grant at a time and then trying to invest that almost in an artwork and then get a, a, a little more after that by celebrating that artwork. So, so it's a little bit of a step-by-step -step, um, um, kind of process, it seems like, or at least in, in, in my experience too, that um, it's kind of slowly growing as you're trusting yourself. And honestly, I think any artist should really trust because again, at, at the end of the game, it seems like our advantage or our uh, uh, kind of um, edge is really just being unique and having something new and even again, using things in different ways completely. So, so again, I wouldn't get into the perfectionist mark as a uh, perfectionist mind as uh, Marcus and Mar Margarita suggested and, and try to just be experimental, break things and, and invest some of these um, grants, even as tiny as uh, whatever it is to just go to the next step. And then I also agree with the connection part. So I was, and uh, Natalie, you may uh, uh, kind of testify on that. But I, I mean, I've been working a lot with the LA community because I graduated from UCLA and didn't tap into our local resources as much. And for the recent Knight Foundation grant, I tapped into a few and they like you all were more than positive and more than supportive. And it was just a blast to, you know, be part of this community. So I think it's one of the biggest edges also we have locally compared to some of the coast um, um, kind of conditions that, um, it, it feels like we are we are just a big community all together pushing um, something and kind of adding to each other's work. So so I think um, that might be another exciting thing. Yeah, I'd say that the looking for small grants to like prototype ideas is really important as well. Um, as in, as someone who's coming from like just entering in this technology space. Okay. I know there earlier on when I was trying to write a bunch of grants, some of the feedback would be like, well, you've never done anything like this before. So we don't know if we want to hand you money to do things. So what I ended up doing is like, okay, but what if I prototype with something small and I get a thousand dollar grant? So then I can show them like, look at this thing that I'm working on. Now I need this larger amount so I can fully realize this small idea. So I don't think you necessarily like have to go for broke the first time out, right? Like you can go for get a little bit of money, try some stuff, get a little bit more money, try some stuff, allow yourself to be iterative. Um, and then when it also comes to like the idea of like writing grants, I think it's really important when you're kind of moving in and you're newer to kind of explain like 
how why you're transitioning into trying to use technology to support your work and how you feel it's going to either heighten or bring you to this new artistic pathway um, and explaining that I think is really helpful for a lot of research. I sit on a lot of grant panels and I know that's a thing that always comes up is they, they wish people would kind of like lead them into like why technology now in your career? Why is it important? Where are you trying to go now that you can't go without technology? And, and maybe just a quick side note, especially with some of the nights or so there are a lot of grants that are just supporting integration of technology as just like equipment um, at the equipment level. And I think just seeing what we, I mean, we all use technology one way or, or the other is just identifying some of those as a way to get some of these grants too. So, so I mean, um, that might also be a pathway to, to get, um, you know, like an entry pathway to some of these grants that we basically, a lot of us use computer at, at the minimum or use, you know, some 3D printer or some of the uh, media equipments or something like that. And a lot of these grants are actually focused on providing some of these uh, basic tool palettes um, for the artists. And, and we may not just see that right away and think of it as a project-based grant. Thanks. I think that's all great advice. And I just a reminder too, um, you know, even if you're not part of a, uh, you know, um, university or something that being able to connect with local artist serving organizations, because they will, you know, be able to help advise on things like budgeting and writing a proposal, because I mean, that's how arts organizations also make ends meet is by writing grants. So um, make sure to get in touch with, you know, your local arts serving organizations like someone in our space and you know chances are you might need um a fiscal sponsor to be able to qualify for those funds too and so some in our space and other local art organizations are able to serve in that capacity as well um so we are we have about five minutes left i want to see if anyone in the audience might have a question before i keep pulling from my list feel free to drop something in the chat or just unmute if anyone has anything Oh, yeah, I've got a question. Um, I was wondering when you were talking earlier about uh, places or online organizations, that type of thing, where you might apply for grants for merging technology in with the art, uh, where might you have been referring to? Where can you find those types of grants at? So in, in my case, I can probably put it in the chat. So I was talking about two. One is Artenda, which I'm going to put it in the chat which is more or less almost like a newspaper for um, all the calls that are coming out. So it takes the hassle a little, well, honestly, I'm a lazy person. So it takes the hassle from a lot of searching part um, um, in some cases. So, so you kind of have kind of like a checklist to go through. But, but also the, the probably upcoming tech grant uh, with, for Night Foundation, which is tech development grant, they call it. Uh, um, and, and, and that should also be more or less for equipping you know, a, a kind of a studio or kind of um, an artistic setup as a way to, you know, engage technology. So it's kind of like a prerequisite, and not prerequisite, but but in a way a support to then get you. So it's more of a supportive grant to to get you in the in the conversation. But but I'll put the art in the in the chat. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Um, we kind of mentioned this at the end of the panel last year, but with technology kind of rapidly changing and advancing every year, um, I'm curious to know what um, types of technologies that you guys are looking forward to in the future and, and in what ways you might um, wish to incorporate them into your artistic practice. We'd like the opportunity to collaborate with some of the larger industrial type printers for obviously some of the work um, that we're doing. That would be one thing we're looking forward to. It's so difficult to identify what's gonna happen uh, in technology, but AI is certainly something that is, it's just, we're just dipping our toe into that. I, I don't think many people realize what of an impact that's gonna do to change our society. Um, and also kind of equalize things for different uh, people. And 
Yeah, I think sort of the the impact that AI will have is right now more it's just not as well defined as we would hope for. I think one of the things coming up that will have a much bigger impact on the visual arts industry, Sora, once Sora is released officially, Sora is basically AI for video. I think that would have a, will have a huge impact. Um, I will. I always say, especially also to my students, AI should be helping you. It shouldn't threaten you. It will definitely shape our industry especially in the graphic design world it will shape it it yeah. will just basically compress and make it faster but if you use this as a tool appropriately it's only helpful but yeah. as far as technologies we're we looking forward to is like we really would like to bridge to industry to large-scale machines like large sort of metal 3d printers and um the technologies that sort of are a little bit kept closer to the vest. I would like to into see industry. a little bit into industry. I would like to see them a little bit more democratized. And so hopefully we can see. Yeah, and you that. can see some of the AI. I mean, that work you showed Ibrahim is beautiful. Um, you know, that that already kind of shows people the direction where where it's starting to go. Exactly. Yeah. And accessibility, yeah, democratization is going to be really interesting. Thank you so much for the kind words. But yeah, and I completely agree that um it's and it's it's moving f very fast, so it's almost tracking or tra you know tracking down something, some like running car or something. So so I think it has some time until it settles into some kind of bigger conversation. Uh, for for me, the, the the thing that I'm looking for, but maybe it's that. So so it kind of settles in a little, uh, as been mentioned, you know, in in terms of its theoretical framework, in terms of its um, authorship uh, kind of concerns and, and things of that nature. Because it has both ends in a way, you know, I completely understand the other side that is their their work is being used to train, but also funny enough, the work that is coming out of the AI machines also are not as um as well kind of protected in a way. So so it's kind of like a weird <laughs> kind of legal stuff going around it. Um but but also, I mean, for me, it, it's just the the optimization that is getting more and more and accessibility that is getting more and more um uh advanced and, and and in a way it's exciting i think in a way it unlocks a lot of artistic powers that are being limited by techniques um and, and we actually going to with my partner yasaman who is a digital artist and um kind of an ai artist now uh, we go, we're going to talk about it um, in a few weeks at um Kent State. but but it, it's 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 an interesting question of what is art and you know beyond the technique uh because kind of it unlocks a lot of artistic powers a lot of kind of um potentials beyond just the mere of technique as art. So, so in a way, it's kind of a, a pop revolution again, in a way, a pop art where, where industrialized art kind of came to the game. So I'll stop there, but but I look forward to how it unfolds. Yeah, so, short and sweet for me. I think I'm starting to get interested in how interactive technology with dance can travel. As someone who tours his work a lot around the country, um, a lot of times when I see kind of the interactive art with dance, it's kind of on a smaller scale, it stays local, but what does it mean to be able to take that into some of these big performing arts centers around the country and it'd be seen as the same level as your kind of traditional, again, lights and tights kind of dance? That's great. I appreciate everyone's insights um, in AI. Again, I think that that's, it's such a big topic and I know there's just a lot of understandably fears around it. I also just know that as all of you mentioned, there's so much potential to use it in, in an authentic and really interesting way. So um, I do think that's a great place to end. Um, I really appreciate all of the artist panelists with us today and sharing all of your insights and a little bit about your work. Um, I do want to let all the participants know I will be sending out a post survey. So please um, fill that out when I send it out. And of course, uh, stay tuned with what uh, Summit Artspace has coming up in the fall. We have a couple other professional development opportunities coming up that I think are pretty exciting. So make sure to follow us on social media, um, sign up for our email newsletter, or just check out our website. So um, thank you all again for joining us this lunch hour today on Friday and um, enjoy your weekends. Thanks for having us. Good to see you. Thank you, you guys. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.